It is March 20th, 2020, and with the coronavirus now hitting the United States, this video is being put out so that our hospital personnel can be educated as to what we currently know about the coronavirus, as well as what our current management strategy is as a hospital. Medical Specialists Associates, making medical education more accessible. I'm Christopher Vascopoulos, a United States-based critical care physician, and I'm presenting to you today this topic on the coronavirus for what we currently understand about the coronavirus and specifically what our hospital management and treatment strategy is at this current time. First, we'll start with the biology. What we know about it is, is that it is a coronavirus and it most likely originally spread from bats and or pangolians to humans. However, at the time that I'm presenting this topic to you now, it is spreading primarily from person to person. And how that's happening is via viral particles that are aerosolized entering into our lungs. Now, specifically, there are viral S spikes on the coronavirus, and those bind to ACE2 receptors on type 2 pneumocytes. And that's how the virus is actually getting into the human body. Now, Though we're, I'm primarily talking about an aerosolization and droplet spread, there are other possible routes of spread, specifically via contact or via the gut. However, at the time of uh, this presentation, we're unsure as to what the significance or contribution that that might play into the coronavirus spread. So what about the epidemiology? Well, we know that it has an attack rate of approximately 30 to 40%. What that basically means is that this is a highly infectious agent. The case fatality rate currently is 3.4% taking all cases on a worldwide basis. However, be aware of the fact that now that we have more widespread availability of testing, and now that we're starting to test more asymptomatic patients, our denominator might get bigger. And what that means is that the case fatality rate might fall as we find more asymptomatic patients. The incubation time is very long, four to 14 days and up to 15 days. So what this means is, is that you could be exposed to a patient today and it could be up to 15 days later before you start to have presentation symptoms. And then there's viral shedding. The viral shedding has a median of 20 days and could have a max of 37 days. So what is our current worldwide strategy for containment? Well, it's quote unquote, flattening the curve. So what does that mean? What that means is, is that what this bar is showing here is our healthcare system capacity. So what if we did nothing at all? No shelter in place, no quarantines, people out living their normal lives. What would happen is, is that so many people would become infected that we would greatly exceed the capacity of the healthcare system. Here at our hospital, we have 20, maybe 40 beds for ICU capacity if we opened up other wings. And if we did nothing at all, perhaps maybe we would go to 100 ICU cases. We simply would not be able to manage that number of patients. And so with the shelter in place and quarantines, we're hoping that we slow the spread of the infection over a longer period of time, hence keeping this curve below what our healthcare system capacity is. So what is our diagnosis and presentation? What do these patients look like when they present to the emergency department? Well, 65 to 80% of the patients have a cough. Upon presentation, approximately 45% of the patients have a fever. Now, specifically during the course of their illness, up to 85% of patients have a fever. And so that's why we're screening by asking patients, have you had a fever recently? Or specifically within the past week. 20 to 40% can present with dyspnea or shortness of breath. Approximately 15% can present with other respiratory infective symptoms. Now, up to 50% of patients could have GI symptoms as their presentation. And we feel as if that this might be one of the original symptoms upon presentation, GI symptoms. Now this is important because we now know of cases that have originally been admitted to the hospital and put on a med tele unit or a med surge unit with a primary complaint of GI symptoms, thinking that we were working that patient up for a GI disease and they ended up being COVID positive later. So in terms of lab testing, what are we finding? Well, we find that since this, uh, uh, in the CBC, we find a leukopenia and a lymphopenia. So not an elevation, but a decrease in the white blood cell count and the lymphocyte count. What do we see on the BMP? We see an increased BUN and creatinine. On LFTs, we see an increased AST, ALT, and a total bilirubin. We can see an increased D-dimer, increased CRP, and increased lactate dehydrogenase. 
We could also see an increased interleukin-6. Now this is important because perhaps maybe this could be a prelude to cytokine, a cytokine storm, and this could be akin to what is called secondary uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. This is something that we saw in the SARS epidemic, and these patients could possibly progress to a very rapid and severe form of ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And in those patients, we might want to think about blocking the uh, IL-6 with an anti-IL-6 drug. If we can see an increase in ferritin, we also will likely see a negative procalcitonin. Now, procalcitonin for pneumonias, for bacterial pneumonias, is positive in approximately 95% of people. So that means that if they're presenting with an upper respiratory tract symptoms and they have a negative procalcitonin, chances are that this is not a bacterial disease, therefore they do not need antibiotics, and it's more likely to be a viral type of uh, disease. Now, you could have a positive procalcitonin in these patients, and that means that you have a concomitant bacterial infection that is superimposed on the viral infection, but we currently think that this is rare. We also want to watch for cardiomyopathy and see if maybe the patient presents with a um, congestive heart failure type picture or some type of cardiac insufficiency picture. If we still have the availability, we want to send a viral biofire. So what this is, is that this is a panel of different upper, upper respiratory tract viral infections that we can screen out. However, this test might not be available for too much longer as we are currently running out of medium to run the test. And we do also want to test for influenza A and B as well, because they can have a similar presentation to the coronavirus. So what do we see on imaging? Well, on the chest x-ray, we see hazy bilateral peripheral opacities. And then on CT scan, we could see maybe one of three or a combination of different presentations. One could be our ground glass opacities, which we see here in the periphery of the lung, or these can be all out and usually bilaterally, rarely unilaterally. We can see this same round glass opacity, but in addition to that, what we can get is we can have these superimposed interlobular and intralobular septal thickenings. We call this a crazy paving pattern. Or this could progress even more, and we can see a flat out consolidation that we can see here, or a consolidation with these air bronchograms as we see here. So what about precautions, patient management, and provider protections? And so Isolation is really one of the most important things that we can do right now. So if a patient presents without respiratory distress requiring hospital treatment, we are to send that patient home to be quarantined, self-quarantined for 14 days. And it's important to note that if we send that patient home to their family, it is presumed that their entire family is positive and their entire family needs to be quarantined for 14 days. If the patient is admitted to the hospital, we place a mask on the patient, we put them in a single room, we limit and re or restrict visitors. Ideally, we would put them in a negative pressure room if it's available. We are also using HIPAA filters in rooms to transform them into a type of makeshift negative pressure room, and that would be acceptable. And we're also cohorting those patients into particular wards so that we can further limit the spread of the, uh, of the viral illness. Now, for precautions for the healthcare providers, we have our standard precautions, but we also have contact. And it's important to note here that we only need single gloves. The CDC is not recommending double glove unless if it's a post-mortem situation, so single gloves only. And we either have airborne precautions for aerosolizing procedures such as intubation, extubation, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or suctioning, or droplet precautions for everything, uh, everything else. This is also important to note here. Now, regular masks are acceptable, and we're only recommending N95 masks to be used only during those aerosolizing procedures that I, that I talked about above. And eye protection uh, should be worn. Other personal protective, uh, uh, personal protective equipment should be donned and diffed with a trainer observer if that's available based on the manpower. And in terms of hygiene, we want to wash our hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. And soap and water appears better, but if that's not available, alcohol-containing gel is also acceptable as well. So what about our current treatment and management recommendations? Well, we're gonna send a PCR test. However, of note, it could take days to result that test. Currently, we're, we have a backlog and it could take up to four days. And so patients are becoming what's called uh, patients under investigation positive for quite a while until those results come back. Now note, no test is 100% sensitive, including our current COVID test. And so it is possible to have a false positive. 
However, in addition to having a false positive based on the test, perhaps there have been instances to maybe where our tests aren't be running appropriately because we're not taking a big enough swab or sample to send off for the test. Now, it's important to note here that clinicians still need to use their clinical suspicion on these cases because there have been documented incidences of people having a negative COVID test and they ended up becoming positive later and infecting people. So we need to keep our clinical suspicion high on cases that we still think are COVID positive, even if they come back negative, perhaps sending another repeat COVID test in a day or two. So especially for the elderly, it's important that when they present to the emergency department, we have an immediate goals of care conversation and we obtain any advanced care directives. Because we are likely to deal with a triage situation, if these individuals based upon their advanced care directives do not want intensive care admission, or do not require or want intubation or CPR. We need to know that at the time of presentation so we can respect their wishes as well as balance our limitations in our healthcare capacity. So we're trying to only use metered dose inhalers in, uh, in patients with confirmed COVID-19 or COVID patients under investigation. This is simply because the metered dose inhaler has less of a chance to aerosolize the particles and it becomes a less infect, uh, infection risk. Now, yes, nebulized uh, treatments might be better. However, this is the balance that we're taking right now to try to have a compromise and a balance between uh, metered dose inhalers and less chance of transmission of disease and nebulization, which might have a small benefit, but a much higher chance of transmission of the disease. If we decide that we have to use BiPAP or CPAP, we want to consider a helmet mask or a full face mask is available. Again, the whole concept there is to try to contain this more in a full face mask so that there's less aerosolization of particles. However, we should also consider early intubation. If a patient is borderline for intubation, it is likely best at this point in time to go ahead and intubate them early. One, so it's an elective intubation, so it's safer, but also because then the patient goes on a closed circuit, and again, there's less risk of aerosolization there. So for our particular uh, uh, hospital, what we have at the current moment is hydroxychloroquine, and so that is what we're recommending uh, for patients uh, to use. And the dose for that right now is 400 milligrams PO BID times one day, and then 200 milligrams PO BID, BID for four days. And we are only starting empiric treatment on patients who meet both criteria of ICU admission and are age greater than 60. If we simply started empiric treatment on every other patient, we could possibly run out of this treatment in less than a week. I am well aware of the fact that you could also use chloroquine as well as anti, uh, antiretrovirals. Um, uh, however, at the current moment, those aren't in stock at our particular institution, and so we are not using them. There's also information rapidly coming out as to which antivirals might be beneficial and which are not. And so we need to stay on top of the literature if we choose to use one of those. So this information just came out this morning on March 20th, 2020, as part of the Society of Critical Care Medicine's guidance on patients with COVID who progress to acute respiratory failure, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And so here we have patients with mild ARDS, here, moderate to severe ARDS, and here patients who are in severe ARDS who require rescue or adjutant treatment. And so a patient with mild ARDS, they're basically being part on the standard low tidal volume lung protective strategy with our standard four to eight milliliters per kilogram uh, of ventilation, as well as keeping plateau pressures less than 30. We are investigating for bacterial infection. Again, that's where the procalcitonin is so important. And we're saying if the procalcitonin is negative to not start antibiotics. And we're also uh, trying to be judicious in our oxygenation, not to over oxygenate the patients and to target an SpO2 between 95 and 96% or a PO2 between 60 and 80, because there is some information out there that hyperoxygenation could be de uh, deleterious to the lungs as well. We're also trying to have a conservative fluid strategy because in ARDS, we have these puffy lungs, fluid filled lungs, and we don't want to contribute to that by giving exogenous fluids and making the lungs puffier to have oxygenation be even worse. Again, empiric antibiotics only in individuals likely who are procalcitonin positive and to consider early systemic corticosteroids. Now at the current time of this presentation, we're leaning away from corticosteroids for early treatment. However, this is different. This is not early treatment. This is individuals who have now progressed to ARDS. So we're not necessarily treating COVID now, 
where we're concerned if we maybe use steroids at the time we're weakening the immune system. Now we're treating a hypercytokine, hyperimmune response where an individual is in acute respiratory distress syndrome and we want to start treating with corticosteroids then and or statins to treat a pro-inflammatory type of ARDS. Now, if a patient progresses to moderate or severe ARDS, now we're probably going to consider switching the patient from the low PEEP protocol to the high PEEP protocol on the, ARDS, on the uh, ARDSnet protocol. This is when we start to consider uh, neuromuscular blocking agents, either as boluses or as continuous infusions for 24 hours. We consider recruitment maneuvers. We consider prone ventilation. And if we haven't already done so, we now seriously consider systemic uh, corticosteroids and or possibly statins we're considering at our institution. And if we haven't already done so, that's when we're going to possibly consider antivirals, our chloroquine, our uh, hydroxychloroquine, which we're using at our institution, or our anti-IL-6 um, drugs. And then if a patient goes into severe refractory ARDS requiring uh, rescue treatment, um, if we haven't already done so, again, we'll initiate treatment here with our antivirals, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, or anti-IL-6 medications. This is when we will seriously consider non-neuromuscular uh, uh, blocking agents if we have not started them already. Prone ventilation, if available at our institution or others, nitric oxide or poss uh, possibly inhaled prostacycline, um, and early transfer to an ECMO center. So we are also in a triage situation. And because of this, at this current time, we're recommending that all ICU admissions need to be approved by the ICU team prior to acceptance, that the ICU team needs to be notified of all COVID patients under investigation admissions, um, which need to be presented to us, the ICU team, prior to admission so that we can review the care plan with the admission provider to make sure that we are following all of our current guidelines that we have in place. And to remember that any use of MDIs or hydroxychloroquine outside of the current hospital guidelines also need to be approved by the ICU team. And with information rapidly coming out, this information just published on March 19th of 2020 in the New England Journal of Medicine shows that Coletra does not appear to be effective in the treatment of COVID. Now, there are several other antiretrovirals that are recommended to try. The efficacy of those are unknown, but at least for this particular medication, it appears that using it is not effective at this time. Thank you for watching. Please consider sharing your suggestions or comments with us at the email address listed. And please also continue to visit with us at our website and our YouTube channel. To be instantly notified of when we release new content, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel as well. Thank you.